بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Sira of Prophet Muhammad Peace be upon him Episode 24 السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ونصلي ونسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى and send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his entire household may Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless all of them as well as his companions and may Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless every single one of us Amin Beloved brothers and sisters we had seen how after the treaty of Hudaybiyah the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم decided to send letters to the various leaders and kings in the region and even outside the region. This was the first time that ambassadors were sent in this particular way, where a letter was written, the Prophet ﷺ being unlettered, he instructed people from his companions who could write, to write the letters. They were short to the point, the message was delivered, and the Prophet ﷺ sent his ambassadors across. We heard about Dihya ibn Khalifa al-Kalbi radiallahu an, who was sent to Heraclius of the Roman Empire who was based in Asham because that was under the Roman Empire. He was not the king of the Romans, but he was the emperor at the time of that particular area that fell under the Roman Empire. So we also heard of how he reacted and how he asked several questions and the fact that he knew what was right and wrong, but because he wanted to stick to his throne and he did not want to earn the wrath of his own uh, men and that is why he did not accept the message. But he sent back Dihya ibn Khalifa al-Kalbi with much respect. A point that, he, that we learn from this particular incident is when the Prophet ﷺ wrote a letter to Hiraqal, to this Heraclius, his companions told him, this man is not going to read your letter because in order to officialize letters which go to the Romans, you need to have a stamp on the letter. So the Prophet ﷺ then asked some of his companions what should be done and they suggested to him that he get a ring that was made of silver with his name on it, Muhammadun Rasulullah. And what would happen is normally it would be written starting from the bottom going up. So Muhammadun Rasulu Allah. And therefore he had a ring. This was not part of jewelry, but it was part of the stamping that the Prophet ﷺ had decided to do because of the letters that had to be sent to these Romans and the fact that they would not be read unless they had a stamp. We learn a lot from this. This was something that was not the way of the Muslims. But it became the way of the Muslims when the Prophet ﷺ did it. He heard that they were doing it and therefore in order to give the message across or to get the message across, he decided to do something that was new to Islam and the Muslims. And from this very interesting point that I just want to add in here, some of the people say it is sunnah to wear a silver ring. And some of the scholars say, no, it is a sunnah to wear a ring if you cannot read and write and you have your name inscribed on it and you would like to stamp letters. So it's just a little difference of opinion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and grant us the acceptance to follow the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many times we find we just follow that which is convenient for us. And when it comes to those things that are a little bit more difficult, we tend to ignore them completely. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. So the hadith of this ring is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari reported by Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an, And he says, I could actually see the white mark on the finger of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the ring. Uh, the other letter that was sent was sent to Kisra, the Persians, what we know today as Iran. 
That is where Kisra was based. And the man sent to him was Abdullah ibn Hudhafah al-Sahmi radiallahu an, whether he got exactly to Kisra right there or whether the letter was then taken by one of Kisra's men, there are two narrations. But when Kisra got the letter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he became so angry, so upset. Who is this man? He ripped the letter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, threw it on the floor and stamped on it. What a great disrespect. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard of this reaction, he said, Mazzaqallahu mulkahu. May Allah rip his kingdom as well in the same way he has ripped our letter. There was no need to rip the letter. So it is reported that within a very short space of time, there was civil war in Persia and his own son murdered him and took over. And there was chaos which resulted in the end of that particular uh, empire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us strength and may he grant us a lesson. We do not disrespect that which is sacred in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. Then there was an najashi We know the Negus who was based in Abyssinia. The Muslims but with the leadership of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu were sent for the first migration to Abyssinia. They were still there. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wrote another letter to him. Several letters were actually written to this Najashi. His name was Ashama. And the Negus was just the title given to the leader of Abyssinia, where we would say Ethiopia, Eritrea, that is today. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala grant us all a lesson from what had happened. When the letter came, it came with Amr ibn Abi Umayyah, Al-Damri radiallahu an, and he presented it to An-Najashi, An-Najashi read it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always wrote connecting the writing to the beliefs of the particular person he was writing to. So when he wrote to An-Najashi, he made a few clarifications about Jesus, may peace be upon him. This is who he was and this is what uh, we believe he is and so on. So An-Najashi read the letter. He thereafter said, look, I know that this is all correct. I actually believe it, but I would like you to know that I don't have much support amongst my top brass and therefore give me a little bit of time and I will then uh, gain that support. And thereafter, I will announce that we have accepted this faith and so on. So these are the narrations that make mention of the uh, Negus of Abyssinia and what his response was. And thereafter, it is also made mention of another letter that was written to an Najashi, which I will pause for a moment and make mention of right now. There was a Sahabiyyah known as Ramla binti Abi Sufyan, the daughter of Abu Sufyan himself. Her name was Ramla binti Abi Sufyan. She was married to a man known as Ubaidillah ibn Jahsh, the brother of Abdullah ibn Jahsh. Radiallahu anhu. This Ubaidillah ibn Jahsh with his wife Ramla binti Abi Sufyan, they were from amongst the believers who believed early and they had migrated to Abyssinia. This man passed away. Exactly how he passed away, there are different narrations. Some say he had developed bad habits and so on. And he passed away. And this daughter of Abu Sufyan, she was now known as Ummu Habiba because she had had a child known as Habiba from Ubaidillah ibn Jahsh. So, because she was the daughter of the leader and now she is without a husband, what should she do? She was an elderly lady, she wasn't a young girl and she had made hijrah. She was from amongst the first believers, which means if we were to make them or if we were to consider those who had accepted Islam before the migration to Abyssinia as the first believers, she was from amongst them. And so if she returned to Mecca, she was going to be persecuted being what a disgrace to Abu Sufyan being a leader and his daughter is following Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if she was to go elsewhere, what would happen to her? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wrote a letter to an Najashi, sent it with one of his companions and told him that when this woman has completed her idda, a certain period of time, then I would like to marry her. So she was married to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whilst she was still in Abyssinia under the eye of this An-Najashi that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had sent and her guardian was a man known as Khalid ibn Sa'id ibn al-As radiallahu anhu. 
Umm Habibah radiyallahu anha became known as Umm al-Mu'mineen. She became known as the mother of the believers, Ramlah binti Abi Sufyan. And by this action, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became very closely related to Abu Sufyan radiyallahu anha. So much so that he was married to his own daughter. So this had happened in uh, Abyssinia and later on, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had instructed the man who had carried the letter who was Amr ibn Umayyah al-Dumri or al-Dumri radiallahu an to find out about those who had migrated and inform them that we are sitting in a period of grace and you may now return to al-Madinah al-Munawwara. They began to plan and to prepare and they then they later started their journey inshallah. We will get to when they arrived in Madinah Munawwara just as uh, the victory of Khaybar was announced. Uh, this is when Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and the others had arrived in Medina Munawwara together with Umm Habibah radiyallahu anha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her. So if you look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's marriages, they were always out of the mercy that Allah had placed in his heart for those who had sacrificed for the purpose of the deen. He had gone forth in order to save them from difficulty, to give them the guardianship that they needed, and in order to be a pillar of support and strength for them. And this had happened in most of the cases. As you know, he only married one virgin. The rest of them were non-virgins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson from this. Where are those who want to point fingers at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? They cannot even be kind to their own wives and they want to speak. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had such a great concern that he used to encourage his companions to look after the widows, the divorced, the orphans, those who have sacrificed for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thereafter, another letter was sent to a man known as Muqawqis. Al Muqawqis, he was the leader of Egypt at the time. And it is reported that Hatib ibn Abi Balta, according to some historians, was sent to Al Muqawqis with the letter. This man got the letter. He did not accept Islam. He understood very well what the letter said. And he decided, look, let me send some gifts with this man, Hatib ibn Abi Balta, radiallahu anhu, to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he makes mention of something important. He wrote back a letter. And he says, look, I have understood what you've said and what, uh, you know, so on. And I am sending you a few gifts. From amongst them are two ladies. Now the term jariya does not necessarily refer to slave girls. No, it also refers to young girls and it refers to young ladies as well. You could say a jariya, referring to a young girl. So he says, I am sending you two of these girls who are from the highest lineages of the Qibt. The Aqbat are the Coptic Christians of Egypt. And remember Christianity and Islam, as well as Judaism, they come from the same lantern as what Najashi had said. From the same lantern, meaning the pure form of Judaism and the pure form of Christianity would lead you to the pure form of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. And then when he had sent, he sent an animal as well, a mule, according to some narrations, uh, to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with a few other gifts. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then took Maria al-Qibtiyah and according to some narrations married her. And according to some narrations, he remained with her as a, a, a person who was a gifted to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I would incline more to the narration that states that he married her. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had a child from her known as Ibrahim ibn Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who passed away in his infancy. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. Many of us sometimes look at those who have lost children in their infancy and we, we lose uh, track of the words we want to say to them. One of the most powerful words we could utter to them after the dua and the reminder that everything is in the hands of Allah is to remind them of what happened to the most blessed and best of creation. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He lost most of his children before he passed away. And he lost more than one wife before he passed away. Subhanallah. So he had lost many of his relatives. In fact, he was born an orphan and he lost his mother when he was also quite young. Thereafter, we find uh, a letter that was written to Al-Mundhir ibn Sawa al-Abdi of Bahrain, the king of Bahrain. This man, Abu al-Ala al-Hadrami was sent to him, radiyallahu an. And when he got the letter, he understood it. He accepted Islam and all the Arabs of Bahrain accepted Islam as well.
They accepted Islam with him. And the Prophet ﷺ received a response from him. And one of the methods of Rasulullah ﷺ was that he did not remove those people from the leadership that they were holding, but rather he helped them, he guided them, and they remained the leaders. So he remained the leader of Bahrain, and he was instructed what to do with the others and so on. And he was given instructions by Rasulullah ﷺ, which he followed properly. Thereafter, there was a letter also that was sent to one of the leaders of Yemen, one of the Umara, one of the leaders of Yemen, who was known, according to some of the historians, as Badan ibn Sasan. And this man had accepted Islam. The same thing happened. The Prophet ﷺ kept him there in Yemen. And even after he had passed away, his son was allowed to take over from him. And then there was a letter that was sent to the Amir of Busra. That was also going up north to the region of Asham, where the Romans had been ruling. And the Prophet ﷺ sent a companion known as Al-Harith ibn Umair al-Azdi radiallahu anhu. On the way to Busra, he passed Mu'ta. And in Mu'ta, Mu'ta is the name of an area, the Ghassanites, the people from the clan of Ghassan, they were ruling it there. And one of the men, Sharhabil ibn Amr al-Ghassani, he got hold of this ambassador of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Where are you going? He says, I'm going to the Amir of Busra. So he tied him up and executed him. So this was a messenger who was killed. Later on, the Prophet ﷺ prepared an army of 3,000 men that marched on to Mu'ta. And inshallah, we will get to that by the will of Allah, perhaps tomorrow. We will look into that particular war. The reason of that war with those Romans was because they had executed a man who was an ambassador to Rasulullah, from Rasulullah ﷺ to them. So people must not think that the Muslims went out in order to spread their religion by the sword. Never did that happen, subhanAllah. It was those who had attacked the Muslims, those who had harmed them. Revenge was permitted. Retaliation was permitted. And therefore, when they were attacked, they had attacked back. Here there was a man. One man was executed. What do you want the Muslims to do? Sit back and wait for the rest of them to be attacked or prepare and go and tackle them. Why did you do this to our man? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. Thereafter, there were letters also that were sent later on in the eighth year of hijrah remember these letters were not all sent together i'm just clustering them together but they were spaced out some of them were sent right at the beginning whilst others were sent even later on amr ibn al-as radiallahu anhu was not yet a muslim but after he accepted islam the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam sent him as well to oman and there were two leaders there in oman it is reported the names were Juf uh, jayfar and abd they were known as al-jalandi and these people, they accepted Islam as well. Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu, who had accepted Islam by the time he had taken the letters and gone. Uh, he had then uh, brought news to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa of the acceptance of Islam of these uh, particular leaders. So these were just some of the letters that were sent by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa As you notice, what happened is Islam spread. It spread further than Quraysh would ever have dreamt of. And this is why, amazingly, not only was Abu Sufyan from amongst those who heard with his own ears what Heraclius had to say, but the others actually accepted Islam. And not only tribes, nations accepted Islam. Just by listening and by understanding this message is good. I haven't gone into the details, but there are very interesting details mentioned in the books of Seerah and the books of history. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. Now, in the seventh year of Hijrah in Muharram, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had had obviously a treaty with the people of Quraysh. So he was not fighting the people of Quraysh, nor was he fighting those who were allied to the people of Quraysh. There was an agreement, we won't fight. 10 years, peace. But what about those Jewish tribes in Khaybar that had made the alliance, or they were responsible for forming the alliance of the confederates that had come to fight resulting in the battle of the trench. The Prophet ﷺ did not forget that. He now told his people, get ready, we are going to Khaybar. Because these people from Banu Nadir, remember there was a man known as Huyay ibn Akhtab. He was one of the leaders of Banu Nadir. He had also run away to Khaybar, 
But somehow he was in Banu Quraidah, the time when Banu Quraidah were being executed and he was one of them who was also executed at the time according to the books of Sirah. But however, his people and some others were there, including a daughter of his known as Safiya binti Huyay. Later on to be known as radiallahu anha, she accepted Islam just after Khaybar. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prepared an army and they went up to Khaybar. This, they had fought these people of the book. And these people were sophisticated people. They had built their homes in a very sophisticated way. They had had three clusters of fortresses. The first cluster had three forts. The second cluster had two forts and the third cluster had three forts and they were built interleading in such a way that you could actually disappear from one to the other. There were underground tunnels also interleading some of these forts. They were complicated people and they had mastered the art of fighting subhanallah and they were well prepared for the Muslims because they knew we are the ones who have assisted and have had masterminded the whole alliance and today we are sitting those two have made peace we are in trouble so they knew this was coming the Prophet sallallahu went to them subhanallah and the first thing he got to one of I'm not going to take the names of every single fort there are plenty forts but he got to the first one and as he got there, they wanted to fight him. The Prophet ﷺ thought, let us cut down some of their trees in order for them to see the numbers that we have come in. And we are here seriously. We are here in order to retaliate their masterminding of the army that came to wipe us out. Subhanallah. And by the help of Allah, the Muslims had won. They were victorious. Remember the wind came and the angels came and so on. So after they had cut it down, these people, they still wanted to fight. The Muslims overcame them and they had run through to the next fort. See, subhanallah, very intelligent people. Then when it came to the second fort, what had happened? The Prophet wasallam surrounded them and there was fighting that happened there again. There was an attack that took place. And after some time, it was quite difficult. These people were attacking. How were they attacking? with arrows, with spears. And then Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu succeeded to get hold of one of the men who was trying to run away in the night. And when he caught him, he brought him to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He says, oh messenger, I caught this man. So he says, look, don't harm me. If you don't harm me, I will give you information of how to overcome these people. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, what is the news that you have? He says, these people are preparing to attack you tomorrow with their army. Meaning they're going to come weaponry. They want to attack you. If you overcome them, I will lead you to a house where there are so many catapults. Now they had huge catapults. What is known in the Arabic language as a manjanik, more like a cannon, where they would put a ball of fire on one end of it and then literally propel that in a way that it would get into wherever they wanted it to get into and it would cause disaster and loss of life and a fire and perhaps chaos more like a little missile as we would word it today missile launcher but obviously of a long time ago and what happened is he said there are these manjanik in this home together with so many different armors as swords and many different weapons so it happened that the following day they fought, the Muslims overcame them, they were led to this home. And before the Muslims actually went in, there is something historic that took place in Khaybar. So much of the seerah, so much of the ahadith that make mention of rules and regulations, you find if you were to look, where did this come from? It was when they were in Khaybar. The Muslims spent just under a month in Khaybar according to some narrations, which means a long period of time they were in Khaybar. And some of the forts, they had gone in without a battle. Some of them, they had surrounded them for a, lot, for a few days. Some of them, they had fought and got in. So there were different types of entrances into the forts by the Muslimin. That evening, the Prophet ﷺ looks at his companions and he speaks to Muhammad ibn Maslamah radiallahu anhu who was a warrior. He was known as one of the leaders of the Muslim armies. The Prophet ﷺ says, Tomorrow, I will give this flag to a man 
whom Allah and his messenger love and he loves them. A man who loves Allah and his messenger and they love him as well. So everyone spent the night hoping that it was going to be them. Umar ibn al-Khattab says, never ever had I hoped to be given some form of honor than that particular day. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bearing witness with the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that a man who loves Allah and his messenger and Allah and his messenger love him too. In the morning, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam calls out, where is Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu? So they said, well, he is somewhere because he's complaining of his eye. He had an infection in his eye. The Prophet ﷺ called him and blew into his eye with a slight bit of saliva going into his eye. And it was cured almost instantly. Subhanallah. This was a miracle of Nubuwa as well. He blew into the eye and Ali anhu was cured. He gave Ali that flag and that title and the honor of the day. And he reminded Ali that, Oh Ali, radiallahu anhu, you are going into Khaybar. You are going to enter here. Remember, لَأَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمُرِ النَّعَمِ For Allah to guide through you one person is better for you than the most expensive of the material wealth that we have here. It was known as Humur al-Na'am, which means the red camel. Red camel means today, for example, you have, what can we say, top of the range motor vehicle. It says, this is better for you than that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So even whilst he was being sent into Khaybar, he was warned, we should not be fighting to kill people. And you see, there was something amazing that Islam came up with. If there was a criminal, we need to listen very carefully because people have misunderstood this. If there was a criminal or there were people who were enemies, they had fought Islam, they had tried to murder or they had even caused murder and they were court martialed to be executed and therefore armies went in order to execute them. They had a way out. What was the way out? They had something that people did not know before. Gift. What was the gift? If you say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, if you enter the fold of Islam, we will forget what happened in the past. You become our brother instantaneously. This was amazing. So it does not mean that the Muslims killed people or murdered people because they wanted them to enter Islam. No. But the people who were murderers and the people who were criminals were given an option that you will be rehabilitated instantaneously by entering the fold of Islam if you opt to do that. Some people opted and they were saved. This is why the Prophet ﷺ says that it is amazing how one man is murdering another and yet both of them are going to be in paradise. Subhanallah. And we can give you many examples of that. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu, he murdered companions who were in paradise and by the will of Allah, perhaps he will also be in paradise. But more than Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu, we speak of the killer of Hamza radiallahu anhu. He became a Muslim. Things were deleted completely. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all Jannah. So the Muslims, they did not compel people accept Islam. No. All they said is, look, you people are criminals. You're going to be executed because of these crimes that you know you have done. In most cases, these people agreed and they said, no, we definitely do know we are guilty. And there, if you really want to be forgiven completely, there is one way out of that. You can enter the fold of Islam. And if you become our brother, then we will forget about what happened in the past. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. I hope I have clarified that for people because many people, to be honest with you, think that Muslims fought and said, we are going to fight you until you accept Islam. What that means is we will fight those who are criminals. But if they decide to accept Islam, which we will invite them towards, then we stop. We are not allowed to harm them. Umirtu an uqatil an nas hatta yaqulu la ilaha illallah. I have been ordered to fight the, the people here talking of the criminals who had fought Islam and who deserved to be executed until and unless they utter la ilaha illallah. If they utter that, I'm not allowed to harm them and hisabuhum ala Allah. 
their record is between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, Usama bin Zaid radiallahu anhu was sent on one of the platoons and he had met a man, one of the mushrikeen. And this mushrik had, was about to be executed and he said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship but Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger. Usama bin Zaid executed him radiallahu anhu. When they got to Medina Munawwara, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was visibly upset, very, very angry. And he said, how could you do that? When he said, la ilaha illallah, how could you do that? Usama says, oh messenger, I, according to me, he only said it to be saved from execution. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and even if that was the case, have you opened his chest to look at his heart, to see upon what condition he uttered those words? The minute they utter those words, they become your brothers in faith. Allahu Akbar. Today it's opposite. We have Muslims in our midst. We look for reason to take them out of Islam. Have you noticed that? So we have people, mashallah, who are Muslimin, not only utter la ilaha illallah, they are in the masjid with you as well, mashallah, reading salah. They know the Quran and so on. And people today actually look for reason to remove a person from the fold of Islam and call him a non-Muslim. Where are we? And where is the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Where he says, once they utter the word, the rest is between them and Allah subhanahu wa taala. May Allah subhanahu wa taala open our doors and may He grant us goodness. So then they had got from there, they fought, and the people of Khaybar from that particular fort or from the first group of forts, as we said, they were three clusters. The Muslims were victorious. They proceeded to the second cluster. Something similar happened there where one by one, they were either fought or they were surrounded and some of them had uh, surrendered and so on. Every fort that they had gone into, they found a lot of wealth, a lot of wealth, subhanallah. And they found different types of wealth, different forts specialized in keeping different types of wealth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and may he grant us baraka in our own sustenance when they got to the fourth fort the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam surrounded them for three days then someone told him from amongst them he said i will show you the water the water that is coming in where it is coming into the fort from so when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw that he blocked the water in order to make them come out because they were heavily fortified. In no time they came out, they began to fight. They were overcome by the Muslimin and there, thereafter they ran elsewhere to the next fort. This was something amazing. And this is why you find some of the names of the warriors of the Muslimin who had fought heavily on that day. One of them, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. The other, Al-Hubab ibn al-Mundir radiallahu anhu. The third is Abu Dujana, the one who fought in Uhud. We say he was a warrior, mashallah. He had taken the sword and until that sword was, was completely used and battered, he continued in the battle of Uhud. And this year, or on this day as well, he was one of those warriors whom they all make mention of how brave he was. Thereafter, they had been surrounded for a total of approximately 20 days in Khaybar. And then the last two forts, they surrendered without any war whatsoever. They said, look, you know what? We're giving up. So this was a heavy war, mashallah. Allahu Akbar. And it resulted in great openings for the Muslimin. And Quraysh was not involved because these people were not under the treaty of Quraysh. These were the people of Khaybar. And the Prophet wasallam decided that he will allow the people of Khaybar to remain in Khaybar. On condition that whenever that agreement was to come to an end, the Prophet ﷺ could bring, in fact, the Prophet ﷺ could bring that agreement to an end at any time. To say, when we want you to leave, we'll give you notice and you're going to have to go. They agreed. Because they know what crimes they committed against the Muslims. Why would they agree if they were innocent people? Why would the Muslims attack innocent people? That has never ever been the case. So this is why you find now in Khaybar, this had happened and the Prophet ﷺ told them, you have all these date palms and the farms of dates. Khaybar is full of date palms. The Prophet ﷺ said, you will work on them, they belong to us. But because of your work, whatever produce comes out of it, you take half, we take half. Alhamdulillah. This helped the Muslims a lot because they did not have expertise, number one. The Ansar did have expertise, the Muhajirin did not. But 
What was of importance is the Muslim men were needed for other escapades and for other missions and to spread Islam far and wide. So the Prophet ﷺ decided to use them and Khaybar, mashallah, produced a lot. So much so that Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu used to be sent there in order to take stock of the produce. They tried to bribe him once. He says, what are you talking about? You want to bribe me? I am coming from the most beloved person to me. You want to bribe me to underestimate what you have or to write wrongly. I don't know what the exact term is, but I'm sure there is a term where they want him to lie that the produce was less than what it actually was so that they don't have to give the half. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. It's typical. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So uh, in this way, mashallah, uh, Khaybar was victorious, meaning the Muslims had been granted victory in Khaybar. There was one major execution that happened in Khaybar. A man known as Kinana ibn Rabia. The Prophet sallallahu knew of the treasure of Huyay ibn Akhtab, who was the leader of Banu Nadir. And the Prophet sallallahu knew that this man had taken that treasure and it was now in Khaybar. So he was looking for it because it was a treasure. It had in it musk, some scent, and it had in it some jewelry and some various other items. The Prophet ﷺ asked Kinana ibn Rabi' where is it? He said, no, it went with the war. We spent it because we had to prepare buying all this and that. So we sold it and we bought weapons with it. He was lying. And this man was a criminal. So later on, they found the whole treasure, the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ instructed that this man we don't want to forgive him like we are going to forgive the rest. See, the rest were forgiven. Why were they forgiven? They pleaded with the Prophet ﷺ, please don't execute us and please don't send us anywhere and so on. The Prophet ﷺ agreed. It is reported that 93 from amongst them lost their lives on that day from amongst the enemy. And from amongst the Muslims, 15 martyrs in the whole stay in Khaybar. 15 martyrs and from them 93. The rest of them were allowed to remain there and they were working on the fields. From amongst those who were taken captive, prisoner of war, one of them was Safiya binti Huyay, the daughter of this Huyay ibn Akhtab who was executed in Banu Quraida. So when she was taken captive, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam then married her after she accepted Islam. Safiya binti Huyay radiallahu anha, she became known as Ummul Mu'mineen. It is reported she became one of the most pious Muslim ladies that there was, subhanallah. And she was such, she was a soft-spoken person and she had a lot of respect for the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Obviously being Ummul Mu'mineen, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam married her and protected that leadership, meaning the high status that she had had before when she accepted Islam, she got an even higher status because now she was the wife of Rasulullah She used to be the daughter of a leader. Now she became the wife of a supreme leader. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding and may he open our doors and may he grant us really spouses who will be the coolness of our eyes. So Alhamdulillah, this was what happened in Khaybar. The Prophet was married we spoke about his marriage to Ummu Habiba. Her name was Ramla binti Abi Sufyan in Habasha. We spoke about the reasons. Here, Safiya binti Huyay. We spoke about the reasons. And at the same time, there was a type of marriage that was prevalent from the pagan days. On the day of Khaybar, the Prophet ﷺ got up and made an announcement that Allah has revealed to me that this type of marriage is prohibited from this day on. What was that type of marriage? From the pagan days, they used to marry a woman when they are on journey or somewhere uh, for convenience, they would marry a woman with an expiry date on the marriage certificate. Believe me, there was actually an expiry date there. Look at all the smiles here. Allahu Akbar. Allah safeguard us. This was known as Nikahul Muta'ah. Muta the Prophet ﷺ clearly said in a hadith that are extremely authentic in most books of hadith. You will find the hadith on the day of Khaybar. He stood up and he made an announcement that this type of marriage is prohibited. It was a pagan marriage that followed through from the time. And as you know, things were being made prohibited in stages. So on the day of Khaybar, that was prohibited. And at the same time, the consumption of donkeys was also prohibited. It was permissible before that. But from that day, the domesticated donkey 
prohibited. Nobody is allowed to eat that anymore. Subhanallah. So I see nobody eats donkeys. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. And may he open our doors. And as we said, this nikah, a temporary marriage, was prohibited by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These marriages that are temporary, known as muta, where a person gets married for a few hours or a few days or a few months or a convenient time and decides I will pay you in lieu of the amount of time I have stayed with you, prohibited on the day of Khaybar. And we should all know this and we should understand and realize this. As the ghana'im, ghana'im meaning the spoils of war were now being gathered, something very, very powerful happened. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. He came with the group of people who had migrated to Abyssinia. He arrived that day in Khaybar, subhanallah. As he was coming back to al Madina al-Munawwara, Khaybar is not very far out from Madina al-Munawwara, perhaps approximately 100 miles out of Medina. So Ja'far ibn Abi Talib came with the rest of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. It's reported that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saw him, he kissed him on his forehead, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And thereafter, he gave them a good share from what was received on the day of Khaybar. The Muslims became extremely wealthy, subhanallah. And they, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent down so many rules and regulations regarding what was received on the day of Khaybar. And it was given also to Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and those who were very poor people who had gone to Habasha. Also, something very interesting, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, from the Ash'aris, the Ash'ari tribe, they had left Yemen in order to get to Muhammad sallallahu They jumped into the boat and they say their boat drifted and it ended in Habasha. It ended in Abyssinia. They met Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, remained there with him until the day he left. So they also arrived in Khaybar together with Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu, he has narrated so many hadith of the Prophet sallallahu he says, I was the youngest of the lot on that day. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Uh, this was what had happened at that particular time. Then, after the battle of Khaybar, there were several groups of people who were also from amongst the people similar to those in Khaybar, who had had settled in various places. The Muslim army went, uh, and what they did is, one by one, they struck agreements with them they made peace with them in some places there was a little bit of a skirmish a bit of a war and thereafter there was an agreement signed and the prophet ﷺ either removed them or he kept them in some instances and told them you may plant and you may harvest and we will share half half just as we did with the people of khaybar so from amongst these were those of Wadi Al-Qura. Wadi Al-Qura was an area where the Muslims also became victorious thereafter. Fadak. Fadak was also given to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for himself and his family. Which means whatever came from Fadak, it was meant for the clan of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The poor from amongst them were looked after by it. More like an endowment to look after those from there. Then after in fact, there was another area also known as Tayma, where also the Muslims had become victorious. After Wadi Al-Qura, something very powerful happened. The Prophet ﷺ, if you recall the previous year, they had been stopped from going to fulfill the Umrah. Now a year later, they were planning to go for that Umrah according to the agreement. Quraysh said, we will come out of the Haram for three days, you will come in. So the Prophet wasallam got his companions ready. According to one narration, he wore his ihram from the Masjid al-Nabawi. And, and as they went out by Dil Hulayfa, he instructed his companions to take their weapons. They said, O Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we promised these people not to take our weapons. He said, no, we will not take them into the Haram. But in case someone intends to break any agreement, we will be ready. This time we're going to have it. So they took their weapons and they proceeded from the Hulayfa until one of the, in, in fact, the Mushriks had sent out a little army. When they got to the Muslims, they saw these people are heavily armed. They went back to report to Quraysh and Abu Sufyan and the others that the Muslims are coming, but they are heavily armed. Immediately they sent messengers to say, Oh Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
We never ever knew you to break a single promise in your life. Why is it that you are coming with weapons? He said, according to our agreement, we will not enter Makkah with weapons. So we will leave our weapons outside Makkah and then we will enter. Subhanallah. So the Prophet ﷺ was extremely intelligent. It is reported in some of the books of history that had they not taken these weapons, perhaps these people with their evil intentions may have wanted to wipe out the Muslimin. Only Allah knows. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us strength. So the Prophet ﷺ had had 70 camels, or sorry, 60 camels for hadi. Hadi meaning sacrificial animals which they wanted to sacrifice in Makkah al Mukarramah. And when they got to a place known as Thaniyat Kada, they left some of the companions there and they left their weapons there and they proceeded into the Haram whilst Quraysh had just left the Haram. The Haram meaning it's not such a big area. The, the Quraysh, in fact, the leaders had left some of the smaller people who were not so important in Quraysh were there. However, what had happened is they were sitting on a hillock. And they began to say, you see these people in Ihram. This is important, we listen to this because it affects us when we go for Umrah now. The people of Quraysh began, began to say, you see these people in Ihram, they are sick, they have the disease of Yathrib. If you recall, we said in Medina there was a disease, there was uh, a plague or a flu or some form of a disease that used to overtake them on an annual basis. And the Prophet ﷺ made a dua and this was actually taken out to Juhfa. So Quraysh was laughing. Look at these people. They are so thin. They are so small. We can wipe these people out. And you know, they were just talking and laughing, making a joke. The Prophet ﷺ then ordered what was known as Ali Tiba and what is known as Ramal. So he instructed his companions to open the right side of the Ihram so that the arm is showing to show the muscle on the right side and stick the chest out to show them that we are not little, you know, people who are weaklings. We are strong men and we walk in a proper way as though an army is walking. Subhanallah. You see when an army is walking, the way they walk, they walk with proper posture. They don't walk slouched and so on. So as they were walking in that particular way, the Prophet Sallallahu was on his camel. He made tawaf on his camel and when he kissed the Hajar, he did so with his stick. So he would touch the Hajar with his stick and then kiss the end of the, the stick which touched the Hajar. This is how the Prophet Sallallahu made that particular tawaf on that day of Umratul Qadha. It is known as Umratul Qadha because it is the Umrah that took place as a result of being sent back one of the years and coming back again. So basically they wanted to do it the previous year. They were now recompensing it by doing it the following year. So after three rounds, these mushriks ran away. So now they were instructed, leave this open for the seven rounds, but you may now take it a bit calm when you're walking. And for that reason, up to today, when we as men go to Mecca for Umrah, we need to open the right arm for the entire tawaf, all seven rounds. And we need to walk briskly with our chest sticking out slightly for the first three rounds. I'm sure we know this. This is the history of it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors and grant us goodness. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thereafter, uh, when he had completed his Umrah, there was something that had happened in Mecca. A lady by the name of Maymunat bint al-Harith, radiyallahu anha al-Hilaliyyah. She was related to Umm al-Fadl being a sister and related to Al-Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib. She was from amongst the Muslims, the early Muslims. Her husband had passed away as well. His name was Abu Raham ibn Abd al-Uzza. And Al-Abbas radiallahu anhu wanted to get her married to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she would then go with them to Medina Munawwara and at least be protected. So the Prophet sallallahu agreed, mashallah, and this was the last of the women that he had married. Her name was Maymunata bint al-Harith al-Hilaliyyah radiyallahu anha, not related to Juwayriyat bint al-Harith ibn Abi al-Durar, who was someone else altogether, we spoke about her. But they were both co-wives of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he married her sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he took her out with him, and only later on in Saraf, 
Saraf is an area just outside Mecca to Mukarramah because they were only allowed three days in Mecca. After that, they had to leave. The Prophet ﷺ went to where the weapons were and instructed those companions to go and make their Umrah. When they came back, the Muslim army then left, the group of Muslims. When they got to an area known as Saraf, this is when they had the Walima and this is when uh, uh, the Prophet ﷺ consummated the marriage with Maymunata bint al-Harith radiallahu anha and this was a gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had granted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If we take a look at this, we will come to know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the most noble of all men that existed. He looked after so many people and he was related to so many people. And at the same time, subhanallah, he was of the highest character and conduct ever. The highest level of character. The Quran says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Indeed, you are on the highest level of character and conduct. Subhanallah. Before I close this evening, I want to make mention of one of the gifts also to the Muslim Ummah that had been given at that particular time after Umratul Qadha. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu says, when the messenger came, when the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came for Umratul Qadha, I was a very shy person. I decided I'm going to go out as well with the leaders of Quraysh and I disappeared. I actually disappeared. I did not want to see the Muslims and I did not want to face those whom I had fought. But he says in my heart, I always knew that I'm fighting the losing party in the losing party. I'm fighting in the losing party against those who are ultimately going to be victorious. He always knew it. He says whether it was in Uhud, whether it was in Khandaq, whether it was anywhere else, I always knew that I'm not going to win. Even the platoon that he was sent in, in order to waylay the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa when they were coming for the Umrah and they had then ended up in Hudaybiya. If you remember, they changed their path. Even then he says, you know what? This man, subhanallah, he's somehow protected. So he had had this in his heart and he was never very happy. He always felt I'm doing something wrong. It is reported that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to constantly ask his brother Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid, who was a Muslim and he was in Medina Munawwara. He used to say, where is Khalid? Ma mithlu Khalidin yajahalul Islam. A man like Khalid, so intelligent, he cannot be ignorant of the fact that Islam is the correct religion. He's so intelligent. He cannot keep on worshipping his idols and so on. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa continued to say, Ya'ti bihi Allah, Allah will bring him soon. Khalid ibn al-Walid says that, you know, he had some friends, he spoke to them and so on. Some gave him this response, that response. And he says, thereafter, Amr ibn al-As and Uthman ibn Talha. The three of them decided we're going to Medina Munawwara and we're going to accept Islam. And this was just after Umratul Qadha. But what, what actually triggered it was something powerful, a letter written by al-Walid ibn al-Walid, who is the brother of Khalid ibn al-Walid, to his own brother Khalid. When he went for Umratul Qadha, he went to search for his brother. He wanted to tell him, my brother, come on, you cannot continue on the wrong side. You've missed a lot of goodness. But because he didn't meet his brother, he wrote a letter and left it there. The brother came back, read the letter from his brother. He's saying, you know what, O oh Khalid, you are on the wrong camp. You are in the wrong, in the wrong camp, on the wrong side. And at the same time, O oh Khalid, you are missing so much goodness. We are living in such goodness. We have highest character, conduct. We are worshipping Allah alone. We have left all the evil of the past and so on. Subhanallah. Khalid ibn al-Walid. It was written in the letter that the messenger keeps asking about you. And he has hope that you are definitely going to come. And he has told us that you're going to come. So Khalid ibn al-Walid closed that letter. He asked a few people some questions. He got hold of two of his friends, Amr ibn al-As radiallahu an, as well as Uthman ibn Talha radiallahu an. The three of them went to Medina Munawwara. And I'm cutting the story a little bit short. When they got to Medina Munawwara, they went and his brother told him, make haste, go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He knows you are coming and he is waiting for you. So he wore some good clothing, he had a bath and so on. And they rushed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inni ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka abduhu wa rasooluhu. Subhanallah. What happened? One of the great warriors, one of those who was fighting against Islam, 
has now turned to Islam. Khalid ibn al-Walid, the man who was guilty of slaughtering so many Muslims on the day of Uhud. The man who was guilty for the losses suffered by the Muslims on the day of Uhud. Here he is. He came to Medina safe and sound. He says, O oh Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These are his first words. He says, make dua that Allah forgive me for every time I have been used in order to attack yourself and the Muslims and all the harm that I have caused. The Prophet sallallahu says, Ya Khalid, inna al-Islam yajubbu ma qablahu. O oh Khalid, Islam deletes all the bad that was done before it. The minute you accept Islam, everything wiped out. The Prophet sallallahu had a smile. Then in some narration say he repeated this thrice. And Khalid radiallahu anhu says, Ala dhalik, upon that condition, which means if it is that, Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He entered the fold of Islam. And this is the story of how Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu accepted Islam. Thereafter, Amr ibn al-As and Uthman ibn Talha also declared their shahada. Although Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu says that I already had the Islam within my heart and my heart was softened towards Islam already. The day when I went back to Najashi in order to lie to him, in order to get Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and the, the Muslimin back from Habasha. On that day when Najashi got so upset and he told me, I know that what Muhammad has come with is indeed the truth. On that day already, Islam had started entering my heart. In fact, Ibn Hajar and some of the, the others say that Amr ibn al-As initially accepted Islam in Habasha. But he had announced his Islam when he came with Khalid ibn al-Walid. So by these three warriors accepting Islam from amongst the leaders of Quraysh, they were considered leaders of the, Qur the army of Quraysh. Subhanallah, Islam had been granted so much strength and there was a new era in the Muslims in Medina Munawwara and in the region. On one hand, you have people entering Islam. You have groups of people coming to Medina to declare their Islam. You have people who are accepting Islam even singularly, top leaders and so on. And at the same time, you have Quraysh, their numbers are diminishing. And at the same time, people who are supporting them are diminishing them. Uh, sorry, are, are diminishing. The Quran says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا أَنَّا نَأْتِي الْأَرْضَ نَنْقُصُهَا مِنْ أَطْرَافِهَا Do they not see that we have come to the earth cutting its sides from around them? Which means their grip on what they were ruling is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. Quraysh is becoming more and more singular than they ever were before. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us. Tomorrow, inshallah, we will continue. We have a few more days and we hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a blessed ending to this series. For indeed, we are in the month of Ramadan. Let's make most of the most of this month to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to learn more about the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad subhanallahi bihamdihi subhanakallahumma bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.